Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? It's okay? Great. Uh, my talk today is how to teach Space Invaders to your computer. And this talk could also be told a very, very brief introduction to reinforcement learning. And I hope that at the end of the talk, you will probably not be able to reproduce everything I, I've shown you, but you maybe have a, a mere idea what is reinforcement learning, how could you apply it, and what, are, could, what could be possible issues that you face along the way. Um, to do so, I will give you a little motivation to begin with, so basically why I care about space invaders. Um, I will try to a very glimpse, surfacey, scratchy thingy about uh, reinforcement learning theory. Um, I will show you an example algorithm that I've actually trained for you to showcase, and I will uh, show you some results and everything, and in the end, obviously, a little summary. So let's go. Before I start, um, obviously a little advertisement block. I work at the FZI Research Center for Information Technology located here in Karlsruhe. Uh, and we see ourselves as a transfer institution between universitary research and applied information technology in the industry. So we try to transfer our, the, the research knowledge to the industry and get impulses back to the to research. That's, in my opinion, a very nice place to work. That's why I like to advertise it a little bit. We have a lot of interesting fields like cybersecurity, software engineering, robotics, uh, assist, ambient assisted living, that's technology that helps elderly people, um, new transportation, autonomous vehicles, and last but not lead, least, also the energy domain. And that's what I work on. And, um, oh yeah, one, one second, please. We're always uh, looking for project partners. Um, that is people who like to have a, a paid research project. We look for partners that uh, will apply for research funding with us. We also have usually open uh, a lot of open jobs for students, uh, theses, and we always look for um, scientists, research scientists. That is people that usually do a PhD aside. And if you're interested in that, well, talk to me, go on our website, check the open positions. It's very nice to work there, really. Okay, that's enough advertisement for today. Um, my research basically tries to improve the energy efficiency of buildings, and I try to do so by using smart algorithms. And um, the idea is basically that you that you try to well consider that that building that you see on the picture yet there might be uh, a PV system photovoltaic system on the roof and it might generate some energy for you but it's it's um, how much energy uh, how that energy is worth for you kind of depends on when you receive the energy so when it always generates energy when you're not at home then you will feed it into the grid so we will receive some money out of it. But if you can store it in a battery and can use it later, um, then you might save more money out of it. And the question is now how to control that battery in order to, for example, optimize your own consumption or in order to maybe stabilize the grid if you consider some smart grid approach. Um, there's a lot of research going on in the field. It's more than 20 years of research now. And most people actually do explicit modeling. Um, what... I'm trying to do is actually I try to develop a self-learning system. That is an algorithm that interacts with the building and figures out how to optimize that building. And if you want to optimize the building, you usually have to take sequential decisions. That means I have to decide now what to do in the next minute and then one minute later what to do next. And these, sequ uh, these decisions will usually influence each other. So if I now decide to charge the battery to full, I will not have a chance of charging it any further in the next time step. Uh, also, um, this interaction means that my algorithm will change the world that it will see in later in the later uh, time, and that's basically the two very fundamental definitions of reinforcement le learning in contrast to deep learning: that you have sequential decisions and that you have interaction, and that is you get some feedback from the environment which you interact with. So, uh, why should you study space invaders then? Um, well, it turns out that Atari games have developed something as a benchmark problem for reinforcement learning. It's a bit like MNIST for deep learning people. Um, that means that <clears throat> whatever paper you open, you usually will find somewhere a little section about this is how good our algorithm has performed on this and that Atari games. Uh, so from my point of view, that's a good starting point but because that means that you have a way lot of actual papers where you can have a look how they implemented their stuff, and you can try to reproduce it to get started. Um, so a little uh, very overview about terminology that you can, well, may understand the rest uh, easier. Well, if you consider the game of Space Invaders, as you've seen it on in the, in the title slide, 
then the environment is the actual game of Space Invaders. And that environment usually proceeds in discrete time steps. And after each time step, the environment will, obs uh, will emit an observation. And this observation is the screenshot. So it's the last, last game you, uh, image you get from the screen. And you will also receive a reward signal. That reward signal means how much score have you received during that last time step while you probably shot an alien ship. So you received some 25 points for that. Um, you will give that reward signal and the observation signal to the agent. And the agent is the program that decides what to do next. And this agent will pick an action. And you will give that action back to your environment. The environment will proceed the next time step, and so on and so on. And I think you see very uh, soon that this is, uh, or very easily, that this is a loop. And this loop will usually proceed until the game is over. And then you have a full episode. OK, go on. Um, well, how can we now approach this? Well. One common approach, where this wall they must, or where uh, most of research is actually happening, I would call a classic reinforcement learning approach. Um, that works like you try to abstract a, um, a state, and a state is where is an absolute position. Where are you in your search space? In your abstract search space, over all your search dimensions, where are you? And what you're trying to do is you try to estimate how good is it to be in any particular state of that search space that you can access. And then you try to, um, for every state that you're actually then in, you try to uh, evaluate, given the possible states I can reach, which one is that that uh, receives most information or uh, the highest reward. And I will then usually enter that state next. But as you already probably seen now, this is a complicated construct. And actually, if you... Um, want to get in deeper into that, and I would actually recommend it because the theory about it is very beautiful, you will need probably a few months of, of reading and looking and I've, I've uh, collected some a textbook and a lecture series and some exercises for you um, on the links. It's not all my, that's not my content. Um, it's by welcome researchers uh, that are very easy and newcomer-friendly entries to that material. But obviously, that theory is far beyond 30-minute talk at PyCon, so we have to find something else. And what we can actually do is um, called evolutionary method. Um, evolutionary method means we use black box optimization. So we try to find a direct mapping from our observations to actions. And that also means that our optimizer, or optimization algorithm, will usually not um, have any information about how the game proceeded intermediately, but it, he will just receive an, a finite uh, signal, like he will put in some parameters, and then in the end he will re uh, receive a reward for that, and that's all he sees, in contrast to the other approach before that had very close interaction for every time step. Okay. Um, in the next slide, I will try to give you a very uh, brief overview how you could uh, implement such a, uh, such a thing, such an evolutionary method, um, using existing building blocks. I follow a, a concept of a paper called World Models by David Ha and Jürgen Schmidhuber. I actually can recommend everybody re uh, re to read that paper if you care for reinforcement learning because it's very well written and has nice applications. In that paper, they um, try to solve those two environments you see as a video in the back. So the videos are actually courtesy uh, well, uh, uh, credit to them. And uh, yeah, let's go further, please. Yes. Um, so first, we need an optimizer. Okay. Uh, so I said we made black block back. Sorry, black box optimization. So we need to optimize something. And the optimizer of choice is in that case, it's called CMAES, which stands for Covariance Matrix Adaption Evolution Strategy. That is usually a very defaulty choice in reinforcement learning and also in other optimization problems. As long as the dimensionality of your, your problem you're trying to solve is roughly below 1,000. Um, that's a reference publication if you want to know more about it. And it's especially um, well often chosen because it's well relatively stable and it has only very few hyperparameters to tune. And that's a nice thing, isn't it? Um, and just to show you that it's actually very easy to apply, um, there's a little code which is actually functional, so that code uh, works and produced at the solution you see below, how you could use such an optimizer. Um, in the first block, we will import the module, uh, set our hyperparameters, that is our initial solution, standard deviation, so how far should we look left and right, um, population size, which is the only true hyperparameter, and um, 
get a or define a reward function in that case. Reward function means that would be the game, you know? Consider this as the game, but as I can't show you the game in two uh, lines of code, uh, this is, uh, I will use the Rosenberg function instead. It's a very common uh, test function for optimization problems. And it has the nice ability that no, no matter how many dimensions uh, you request from it, the optimal solution is always at one, 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 one. Uh, and then there are so many ones following as much dimension you're having. And <clears throat> the uh, second block is then just the, the loop that will actually execute the code or the, would let the, the optimizer run. And all it does is it's three steps for the optimization. You will, in the first step, sample from a multivariate Gaussian. That's the mathematics behind CMAES. Um, you will compute the rewards corresponding to the um, candidates you, um, you got from the algorithm. And you will tell the algorithm back how good their candidates have been. And after what the, uh, what the algorithm then does as is, um, he will see like, okay, I've go, I've, you have sampled 25, um, 25 candidates. These were the rewards for these candidates. Now I know which ones have been performed good and which ones have been performed worse. And I would try to um, get my multivariate Gaussian uh, or modified in such a way that I get more good results. And as you also can see on the uh, very end of the code, it nearly found the optimal uh, point. So I hope that's a little proof it works. Um, so now go on. Now we have that abstract optimization algorithm. How can we apply it to space invaders? Well, the most simple approach that you can use is actually you make a direct mapping from observations to um, actions. And the actions in that case are... Uh, Six integers, actually, which correspond to left, right, fire, do nothing, left and fire, and right and fire. And for space invaders, well, the input is actually the image we receive. And now comes the tricky part. The, in the image consists of 210 times 160 times uh, three color channels, and that's roughly 100,000. And then you have to map it to uh, six outputs, so that leaves you with roughly 600,000 weights. Need you need to optimize. But I told you before that CMAES works only if you have an, uh, a dimensionality below 1,000, and 600,000 is very much larger than 1,000, obviously. So the solution proposed in the paper is to use an autoencoder to reduce the dimensionality of your problem. So next theory, and I promised hopefully last theory slide, um, what is an autoencoder? Well, an autoencoder is a usual neural network, or actually two neural networks, one for encoding, one for decoding. And what you do is you map your input, yeah, like say your image, usually it's an image, um, to a network, and that network tries to compress it. And in the end, it will have some bottleneck. So that's a, a reduced, or you could say compressed representation. In my case, it's 64 float numbers. And... Um, after that, you have a decoder, which then tries to reconstruct the original image. And you train an autoencoder by comparing your original input with the reconstructed input and put that in a supervised learning algorithm. Um, so it's not really supervised because it has no labels, but it still uses supervised learning, so as many people call it semi-supervised learning. If you want to know more about autoencoders, there's a nice blog spot from Keras where they have their interactive code examples and anything, and you can play around with that. That's all the depth for, for me for today. So let's see what happens if we actually do that. Uh, the training algorithm I've um, implemented looked at follows. Well, in the end, uh, sorry, in the beginning, I have uh, built and trained the autoencoder with episodes generated by random policy. Random policy means I've told the, the game that it just pushes button like you probably did when you were younger and you played Tekken, you know, or I did at least. Um, that's the same thing the game does. Uh, to to get uh, images for the or to create images for the autoencoder, and afterwards, next step, we will build the agent model. That's a neural network, 64 inputs, six outputs, fully connected, no hidden layers. Uh, we will initialize CMAES and then enter our repeat loop. For each uh, loop, we will sample 32 candidates, um, compute the average reward over three episodes because the Space Invaders environment is kind of stochastic, so it always behaves a little bit different. And we want to have a solution that performs good like many times, not at just once. And um, afterwards, we trigger the optimization step, giving all the 32 rewards back to CMAES and let it work. 
And what comes out of there is actually the, the plot you see on the uh, right side. Um, and what's in that plot on the y-axis, you see the reward. On the x-axis, you see the generation. And um, the blue line is actually the average reward over all members of that, popula of, of that generation. And the um, orange line is the best agent found through that generation. And actually, the best agent I found uh, through all the training time is at generation 86. And it has produced, well, at least in the training, a reward of 630. But if you evaluate it later, like said, let it play for another 50 episodes and average that, you will see that the agent only uh, received a, an award of 252, which is roughly 100 points better than just pushing buttons. So the question, that's a little bit, it's okay, it's better than doing random, so that's at least good that it means that it does optimize anything, uh, but it's still much below what I've expected when I started this and when I handed in this, uh, this talk or when I applied for it. And now I ask myself, um, why, why didn't it get any better? You know, in the end or in the beginning, it, it found a, a, a solution very fast, like in few generations found a good solution and then it didn't learn anything any further. So why is that the case? So let's have a look at the actual gameplay. Um, what you see here is the, um, the agent on the left side, you see the best, the, an average episode of the best agent. And on the right hand side, you will see the reconstructed image as it is um, given by the autoencoder. So you put that image, which you see on the left side, uh, through the decoder, um, encoded, now it's re encoded and decoded again. And then you will see, receive that image. So that's an indication what the algorithm actually has seen of the game. And if you now have a closer look in it, you will see that actually there are no lasers. So and it's pretty pointless to, space, uh, to play Space Invaders if you can't see the laser shots because you will just randomly die and you don't know why. Um, what you can also see is that the, the player ship disappears once it uh, enters the right side. And you will also see that um, the right column, that's, do you see, yeah, that, that one, that column here, uh, will be shot by the uh, agent later in the game, but it still remains there. So it doesn't dis disappear what, we, what we've expected. And it, you will also see that this la uh, the mothership, which is this thing here, which is very... Uh, um, which gives good scores if you sh uh, shoot at it, uh, it's also not visible. So, okay, what fun finding is the autoencoders actually, or autoencoders in kind of general, have actually a problem with finding details or encoding details. Uh, and about the right-hand side, like now, where this player ship just disappeared, well, the answer lies in the, in the training algorithm. And because I told you that we just pushed buttons, what the um, actual agent or the training agent, random policy agent did was it was just going a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right, but on average it stayed where it spawned. And that's exactly the behavior you see here. So here it has a good chance of actually uh, shooting away these aliens here, and it has also a good chance of being here. So as long as the ship is here, the outer encoder learns that and says, okay, that's the outer, that's the ship, I'm gonna, I have know how to reconstruct it. And also if the aliens disappear here, they will disappear here too. So that's great. Um, but I, would, uh, I was actually a bit shocked how low the generalization ability of the autoencoder actually is because I thought, like, you know, come on, this here, it's not so far away. It's the same ship, it's the same game. You could, could have learned that, but obviously you can't, or the code can't. can't. Um, yeah. So that leads me to a little of pre-conclusion slide. Uh, what can you now actually do um, to teach Space Invaders to your computer after you've seen that the approach I showed you before didn't work out so well. Well, you can use um, classic reinforcement learning method. So that's the method I've told you before with the state space. Um, you can pick an algorithm from scientific publishing, uh, publications, that's very nice, uh, because it means that you can have just go to the journals, see which, um, which algorithm performed best for that game yet you want to train, and pick that algorithm and you have to re-implement it. It's also, maybe you don't even have to re-implement it and can just use these nice open source libraries like TensorForce or Baselines, which are, say, kind of depends. I think if you are a data scientist, you will find that familiar. If you're like a usual Python developer, you would say like, ah, oh, this code is really messy. Um, depends on your view, but you may have a starting point. The point is, if you want to do so, you probably need to um, 
know about or have some domain knowledge or learn something about classic reinforcement learning theory, because if you don't, you will have a very hard time optimizing these algorithms or tweaking them because you don't really understand what's happening there and why people have done and implemented what they have implemented. You always need some deep supervised learning knowledge too, because most of the reinforcement learning theory builds up on somehow on uh, deep supervised learning. Well, the good thing is, if you're going to do so, you have a very high chance of success because, well, obviously other people have done that before and they've proved in papers that they can, can do so, so you probably can do so, can do so too. Um, but the point is, most of these algorithms are kind of tweaked towards space invaders because that's the benchmark problem, or like uh, Atari games. So it's not very certain how good they do generalize on other problems you might want to solve. Like in my case, how good is it now to control a building with that? Um, the other option is obviously try to uh, fix the evolutionary reinforcement learning method I've shown you. Um, you could start where I ended in the end uh, optimizing. Um, you could try to add a loop around the outer encoder and the uh, training of the agent. That would give the outer encoder a chance of learning also states which he hasn't seen in random uh, by the random agent. For example, that's a uh, thing where the, the ship was on the very right hand side of the screen. I think if you would give some training examples to the outer encoder, he could learn that too. Um, you could also support learning the laser shots. Uh, you could e.g. Um, make a big white box around each laser shot and I actually try that out so that works um, to improve the visibility and that would also um, give the outer encoder a bit more chance of of learning that and learning all relevant features but the kind of takeaway is actually from outer encoders that outer encoders are well um, teaching outer encoders what is actually relevant of the picture or of the video you show them is non-trivial and hard thing to do. And if you want to uh, stick with that evolutionary reinforcement learning method, you better be very good in computer vision and know how outer encoders are really detailed and how to tweak them. Um, maybe then this might be an easier approach for you. You also need, obviously, deep supervised learning because that's what uh, the outer encoder is all about. Nevertheless, um, it's uncertain if you have good success, um, but it might translate well. If you, well, at least if you find a way to tweak that auto encoder in such a way that it uh, handles the game nicely. Okay, that leaves me with a summary. So I hope to show you that reinforcement learning is actually beautiful and it has interesting applications, but it's kind of also challenging. And um, to solve reinforcement learning problems, you may wish to study the extensive theory, which I can recommend to you. Um, well, if you don't want to do that, you can still use evol the evolutionary method. If you want to do so, CMAS is a reliable choice um, to begin with, but only if your dimensionality is below 1,000 or roughly 1,000. Um, if it's above 1,000, you may still use outer encoders, or yeah, well, try it at least. Um, but you should know that if you want to use autoencoders, you must really take care of the details. And um, you must take care that all the observations that this autoencoder should encode are actually in the training. So alternatively, many common reinforcement learning algorithms are available and free to use. That's a nice thing. But you, again, need to know the theory to use them. So after all, if you want to have a look in it, um, all the code I used for training the examples you've seen on the screen is online on my GitHub repository, also a um, PDF version of the slides if you want to have a look at the links and everything. And if you want to contact me because you now want to apply it after I, I'm very happy for your application. Now, just joke aside. Uh, also, if you have any other questions, uh, contact me. And please, if you're interested, uh, connect on LinkedIn. Thank you. So thank you very much for the great talk. Um, are there some questions? Uh, yeah, hi, nice talk. Uh, one clarification question for the autoencoder coder. Did you use convolution and deconvolution, or was yes. it okay? It still didn't work well. So it's uh, three three convolutional layers, and then uh, dense layer in after end. 
I mean, autoencoders need a lot of fine tuning and maybe a different configuration. Yeah, I think I've spent like, I don't know, 150 hours of GPU time on fine tuning the autoencoder. And actually, if you, if you, in the very beginning, like this result you've, I've shown you in the end, that's actually very good. If you compare what uh, the other people from the World Models paper have as a result, then I think there are less details in the picture compared to that, especially because the picture is kind of high dimensional. Like usually autoencoders are trained on 64 by 64 uh, pixel images. So I'm, at least a little bit proud about the result, actually. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, some more questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, so for games like Space Invaders, you, you have kind of simulation environment where you can run your reinforcement learning algorithm. But will you have the same for like controlling a building? Kind of depends. Actually, um, I think for to start with, we will have to build something similar yeah? to get like a very, say, a first training example. Uh, if I have to do something similar in this building, I would actually um, start in a simulation then move to one building and try to, to do some transfer learning to transfer these results to another building. Because um, what actually other people did, they, they tried to do that, and they just found out that their reinforcement learning algorithm works really good after just two and a half years. And if your reinforcement learning algorithm will shut down the, the heating for two and a half years, well, that's probably not going to happen in real life, is it? Okay, time is over, so please let's thank David again.